In chapters 9 to 11, Paul deals with the Jews' relationship to God in this age. Now there is no doubt about the Old Testament. From Abraham on, the Jews were the nation God chose to rep represent him in the Old Testament. The term the elect so far in the New Testament, Matthew to Romans, has been a reference to be a nation of Israel, not to every person God chose to be saved. That last statement is important to get, for throughout chapters 9 to 11, the terms elect and election are going to keep popping up. Those are sure fire invitations for every Calvinist within a hundred miles to come seeking a tulip patch. But when we get through the New Testament, it's obvious that Israel as a nation has rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah. While there were, by Acts chapter 21, many thousands of Jews which believed Acts chapter 21 verse 20, the majority followed their leaders who had rejected Christ. In the book of Acts, the leaders of the nation rejected the witness of Peter and John in Acts chapter 4, the witness of the twelve apostles in Acts chapter 5, and the witness of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. During Paul's ministry, there were three significant times when the Jews of region rejected Christ and Paul officially turned to the Gentiles to de deliver gospel. The gospel was rejected by the Jews in Asia Minor, representing all of Asia except the 13 verse 46, by the Jews in Greek, representing Europe except 18 verse 6, and by the Jews in Rome, representing all of the world except 28 verse 28. In each of those places, Paul preached, there were always some Jews which believed, but the implication of the passages is the most of the Jews didn't trust Christ. The most influential leaders who could have turned the hearts of the people by their obedience to the gospel rejected Christ. From Acts chapter 28, verse 28 on, the many thousands of Jews which dwelt in Jerusalem and believed died out or were dispersed in Anno Domini 70. From then on, Jews getting saved were the exception, not the rule. The rule was Spaniards turning to Christ, Britons turning to Christ, Courts turning to Christ, Scots turning to Christ, Irish turning to Christ, Slavs turning to Christ, Finnish Ukrian turning to Christ, etc. The rule was a Gentile pride of Christ as concerning the flesh. So the question arises, what is the relationship of Israel to God in this age, the church age? If you ask the modern Catholic under the leadership of any pope, he would say that Israel is under its own covenant to God and doesn't need, to, need the gospel preached to it. Immediately following this, he said that Israel is immorally and illegally possessing the land of her covenant and the so-called Palestinians deserve the land with Jerusalem being an international city and robe protecting the holy places. And not to forget covenant theology, where Catholic and many other believes that they are some kind of new Israel or all the promises which are to Israel and Jewish people are toward the church, Catholic church, etc. If you ask for many kind of apostate people, you would say that someday every Israelite who ever lived will be saved. So you don't need to witness to them. Where that place is, Korah, Datan, Abiram and the rich man of Luke chapter 16 right now, is a thing beyond comprehension. A Baptist who believes that comes out believing in a limited sense exactly what Muhammad taught, Surah chapter 6 verse 9 and chapter 11 verses 106 to 107 about hell at least for the Jews. Muhammad's 600-winged angel Gabriel told him that hell was only a temporary place of purification, in which case you should really spell purgatory. Well, so much Catholic believes also. You don't go to purgatory if you die in your sins without Jesus Christ. You go to hell like a bullet. Now, before we get into this discussion about the Jews, if you want to go by the book, the Bible, then you are for Israel nationally. 
I don't believe any church has taken the place of Israel in this age or any other. God temporarily, not permanently, as the Amplified Version teaches in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16, has set aside Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. We have seen God working with Israel again. The nation has been restored back to its land. God has begun to gather the Jews from the north, Russia, back to the land. This has been happened and still going on. But when it, when it comes to Israel's spiritual condition, every unsaved Jew on the face of this earth is a hell-bound sinner in need of a savior. If he hasn't received Jesus Christ and his sacrifice as the atonement for his sins. We don't need to curse one descendant of Abraham anywhere. God himself cursed them. John chapter 3 verse 18, Galas, Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 15 to 16. Anyone who reads Deuteronomy chapter 28 realizes that the worst enemy Israel ever had in any age is Jehovah God himself. When the Jews claim responsibility for the blood of Christ through their generations, Matthew chapter 27 to 25, God took them at their word and acted accordingly. Rabbis who say that they are not God's people and God's chosen people are deadly wrong. Demonstrators all over the world, wherever they are now, and whatever their opinion is from river to the sea, who think that whole Israel country belongs to Palestinians, etc., are deadly wrong. And Jews themselves, when they don't accept Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior, and God of the Bible, and God of the Old Testament, and they deny all those matters are deadly wrong. And whosoever in the world, if it believes the same, is deadly wrong. So when it comes to the best blessing a Christian can ever bestow on a Jew, it's to introduce him to Jesus Christ through the gospel. When it comes to the worst curse you can place on a Jew, it's to ignore him altogether and let him die in his Christ-rejecting state and go to hell. Blessed is he that blessed thee, and cursed is he that cursed thee. Numbers chapter 24, verse 9. And that reference was to the nation with all twelve of its tribes. You can't get out of it with so-called lost tribes, Khazars, protocols, word banks, the Illuminati, the Rothschilds, or the Bilderbergers. You, who always hate Jews and their life and Old Testament and whatever promises and whatever they are, and you are anti-Semitic. You are heaping curse upon your head and maybe your country also. Physically, Jews are still under God's care and promises. Spiritually, they are under the judgment of God. Support them as a people and lead them to the Lord, but speak plainly to them when it comes to salvation and don't give place to their infidelity. With that said, let's look at the text of Romans chapter 9. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed for ever. Amen. Paul is a great one for conscience. He told the council in Acts chapter 23, verse 1, I have lead in all good conscience before God until this day. He told Felix, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Acts chapter 24, verse 16. He told Timothy to hold faith and a good conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. He wrote of false teachers who had their conscience seared with a hot iron. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And he told Titus that the conscience of the unsaid is defiled. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. 
Universe one, he says, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. The conscience of a saved man has double weight. In an unsaved man, a conscience is in him, but the unsaved man is stuck to his flesh. The conscience is a voice alone in the wilderness, in the unsaved. It has nothing to cleanse it in the case of sin. Paul says it's defiled, made filthy by the sins in the flesh, Titus chapter 1 verse 15. But in a saved man, the conscience is cleansed and renewed. Moreover, the Holy Spirit dwells in the same place as the conscience. Paul says the conscience bears witness to the truth in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit strengthens the conscience in the saved man. Every saved man ought to have twice the sense of what is right and wrong as an unsaved man has. The Holy Spirit has an added help to his conscience. Some people before salvation have a conscience that is almost dead. Then they get saved and it's as if a light comes on inside of them. Suddenly they see all kinds of things that are wrong with them. That's the Holy Spirit bringing that conscience back to life and back into operation. Verse 2 is one of those great paradoxes in the Christian life. The apostle who said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, and rejoice evermore, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, is the same apostle who says in verse 2, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. The Christian life is a whole series of paradoxes, and Paul lists them in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 7 to 10. Notice verse 10 of that passage as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. When a Christian sorrows, he sorrows in hope, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. And when a Christian has hope, it causes him to rejoice, Romans 5, verse 2. So it's possible to have both at the same time. The great heaviness of verse 2 is the burden which Paul had for lost people. In particular, the burden he had his own people, the Jews, that burden leads to sorrow. The psalmist said, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sieves with him. Psalm chapter 126, verse 5 to 6. That was Paul's condition. He loved his people and he wanted to see them saved. He wept over them, he prayed for them, and he preached them. As a result, Paul always saw a few Jews saved wherever he went, but those few were not enough to pluck out his burden. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, verse 3. Now that's quite the wish. The only person from a totally human standpoint who ever came close to what Paul said was Moses. Exodus chapter 32 verses 31 to 32. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O this people have sinned a great sin. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Paul and Moses were kindred spirits when it came to being burdened for their people. Of course Moses couldn't do it, and neither could Paul. Notice the optative in verse 3. I could wish... Paul never said he did wish and he never said he could do it. He had just gotten through saying that nothing could separate the Christian from God's love in Christ Jesus back in chapter 8, so he knew better. But if he could have, he would have. That burden Paul had for the Jews was bad. It was bad not only because it was a deep, heartfelt burden, Romans chapter 10 verse 1, but because it was so overpowering at times that it robbed Paul of his discernment and good sense. In fact, that was about to happen after Paul finished the book of Romans. As Paul wrote Romans, he knew that Peter, John and James, the Lord's brother, were the apostles called to minister to the Jews, and especially the Jews in Jerusalem, Galatians chapter 2 verse 9. He knew that he was the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans chapter 11 verse 13, chapter 15 verse 16, and should be headed to Rome and then to Spain, Romans chapter 15, verses 24 and 28. 
Nevertheless, he was headed for Jerusalem to take an offering from the Gentiles to the Jewish believers there. God warned him of what was going to happen throughout Greek, Macedonia and Asia Minor, Acts chapter 20, verses 22-23. Do you know what Paul's reply to the Holy Spirit was? Acts chapter 20, verse 24. None of these things move me. God, I'm going to do it, and here are my P.O.'s reasons. That's what he said. He landed at Tyro, and when he got off the boat, he discovered a bunch of disciples there who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not, should not go up to Jerusalem. Acts chapter 21, verse 4. What did Paul do with such a warning? Why? He did what any lost person does during a Sunday morning invitation. He waited until the pressure was off and went his own way. Acts chapter 21, verse 5. Then he was warned by Agabus, the prophet, who gave him a visual aid of what was going to happen. Acts chapter 21, verses 10 to 11. All of his friends got the message and begged him not to go. What was Paul's ex excuse for going? I'm ready to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts chapter 21, verse 13. The problem was that if he had died, it wouldn't have been for the name of the Lord Jesus. It would have been for his own stubborn will. Even while he was in the temple, the Lord himself warned Paul and his message was, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Acts chapter 22 verse 18. How much clearer could one get? But in the face of the Lord speaking directly to him, Paul fell into the Peter syndrome, Acts chapter 10, verse 14, and argued with God, Acts chapter 22, verses 19 to 20. The result was Paul losing two years of his ministry in a Roman jail, being beaten by a mob, being shipwrecked, being bitten by a poisonous snake, and having his audience limited to those who could see him in his hired house. You say, well, the Lord took care of him through all of that. Sure he did. But if he had obeyed God, he wouldn't have had to have gone through any of it. A burden doesn't always constitute a call. Paul had a burden for the Jews, so much so that if he could have, he would have gone to hell, if by so doing they would have been allowed into heaven. Of course, it takes more than a deep-seated love for someone to keep them out of hell. It takes a sinless sacrifice. Jesus Christ did what neither Moses or Paul could do. He actually did take the curse of sin on himself to save not only the Jews but the Gentiles as well. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. He did it despite his own personal wishes. Matthew chapter 26 verses 39 and 42. The problem is not what was done for the sinner or even why it was done. The problem is with the sinner's response to what was done for him. The Jews had Moses prophesying the coming of Jesus. Many had personally seen Jesus Christ and had heard the things he taught. And then they had the witness of Paul. The Jews could see how dramatically the Lord Jesus Christ had changed Saul of Tarsus. Having all of that, most of the Jews rejected Christ. So the problem wasn't with God or Moses or Paul. The problem was with the Jews themselves. In verses 4 and 5, Paul says something very like that. Back in Romans chapter 3, verse 1, he asked, What advantage then had the Jew? The answer was in verse 2, and it was much every way. The reason was what the Jews had received from God in the context of scriptures. Here in Romans chapter 9, verses 4 to 5, Paul again lists, lists the advantages the Jews had which should have led them to receive Christ. First, they were adopted as a nation to be God's son, his chosen people above all other nations, Numbers chapter 23, verse 9. Second, they saw the actual glory of God in the Old Testament. That glory was manifested in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, which led them through the wilderness. Later on, it was the cloud of God's glory which hovered over the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and the temple. Third, they received the covenants of God. Those covenants were the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12 and 15, the Mosaic covenant, Exodus chapter 19 and 20, 
and the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7. They were even offered a new covenant in the person of Jesus Christ, if they would have received him, Matthew chapter 26 and Hebrews chapter 8. Fourth, they received God's written law and eventually all of the scriptures, Romans chapter 3 verse 2. Fifth, they were given the service of God, that was the tabernacle, the priesthood and the instructions for being a peculiar people in Exodus and Leviticus. Sixth, they were given specific promises by God. Those promises sometimes took the form of prophecies and proverbs. They were personal as well as national. They were negative and positive ones. They were given to king and peace and the like. They were given in dreams and by prophets. They are found all the way through the Old Testament. Seventh, they had the Old Testament fathers as their progenitors and examples. That would be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve sons of Jacob, especially Judah and Joseph, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 29, that list should also include David. 8. Finally, they are the people through which physically Mary, Jesus Christ, came. Verse 5 is one of the greatest verses in the Bible on the deity of Jesus Christ, so you can expect all of the new Bibles to change it. As it reads in the authorized version, there are two expressions describing who the Christ that came in the flesh is. A. He is the one who is over all, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. But he also, he is also B. God blessed forever, Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. Some new Bibles read, Who is over all? Let God be blessed forever. This destroys the apostles. Appositive, which identifies God as Jesus Christ, it's a Jehovah's Witness reading. They don't mind Jesus being a demigod who is over all, just as long as he is not God blessed forever. Now notice, Paul listed eight advantages the Jews had, and Jesus Christ coming in the flesh is the eighth one. In the Bible, eight is the number of new beginnings. The Jews should have received Jesus as their Christ, their Messiah King, and they would have had a new beginning as a nation. That is what will happen at the second advent. But that is not what happened in the Gospels. The Jews ended up rejecting their king and taking the Roman dictator in his place. John chapter 19 verse 15. So the things that should have given them the advantage, Romans chapter 3 verses 1 to 2, actually ended up being to their loss, Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 to 8. It was to the Jews, detriment, that they could claim all of these things, for they would be counted against them in the day of judgment, because the Jews didn't let those things lead them as a people to Jesus Christ.